Uh, okay, let me thank the organizers um, uh, for inviting me to give this talk. Hopefully, it will become an annual event. I mean, my talk, obviously. Uh, so, uh, um, I'm going to describe something which we decided to call holographic fish chain in, in a danger to be misunderstood because it was too close to 1st of April. But <coughs> I will try to give a justification for this name. Uh, if I can make this work. Doesn't work. Right. So, okay, so I have some aims, right? So, obviously, so initially we had no no real aims just to have fun. But if you try to a posteriori give some uh, kind of aims and pretend to have a really clear research plan, <laughs> <laughs> that's what it is. So, it's first principle derivation of uh, holographic dual because we have this nice fishnet theory and if there is a hope to understand uh, how to derive ADS-CFT, so fishnet should be first to go, obviously, because if we can't do it there, then it's hopeless. And then, uh, in this way, we will get, hopefully, proper playground for holography, especially interesting that um, it doesn't have any supersymmetries. And uh, uh, finally, like, my personal motivation is to Developed, uh, developed this SOV-based approach to the correlators, uh, which now we saw uh, there is a huge progress how to compute it order by order, and in some cases you can resum uh, if it's very long operators, but if you ask what, what are the correlators, very short operators, then it becomes uh, pretty exponentially complicated if you show this in perturbation theory at the same time. In SOV, you can hope to resum all the wrapping corrections uh, uh, straight away, and then this would give a uh, good playground to that. All right, so the final goal is to maybe we can even describe this base, right, which was announced a few hours ago. Okay, this doesn't look really nice. Okay, this slide with citations. Okay, so I have one citation which I, I'm paid for and others to cover up for that. And uh, <laughs> uh, so maybe this bit should be cut from the beginning. Okay. <laughs> so let me again uh, uh, present you Fishnet uh, Lagrange. So the reason is that uh, Zhao was missing for pi, sadly, and uh, Benjamin decided to call Xi by G. It's like no culture. And, uh, uh, oh, this we already did this one, right? That's not, <laughs> <laughs> hopefully I get to say that now. So, uh, some features, right, which we already discussed. So first it's conformal, maybe, I mean, now there are some uh, shadows over the statement. <laughs> uh, so it's integrable. Uh, as a feature, you can say it's a C, depending, non-supersymmetric, non depending on your viewpoint. You can also say it's a feature that it's non-unitary. And uh, so this talk I will present that it's also uh, has holographic dual, at least in some subsector, uh, which contains a huge number of absorbables. <coughs> so in this, this way, we kind of have as good uh, theory almost as n equals 4, but the advantage is much simpler, of course. So uh, to give some motivation and uh, just to remind the key features, which uh, I want to reproduce in fishnet here. Let's give a look to n equals 4 again. So that's uh, as explicit as, as I can. I wrote this uh, n equals 4 Lagrangian. Some people may know some references from 80s where it's even more explicitly. Uh, and uh, then the uh, subsector which I'm going to consider today uh, is this one. So basically you can have any operators and ideas and uh, R symmetry, uh, which is described by three charges in general, uh, I only allow for one charge to be excited and all others I set to zero. Right? So only phi one can appear in neutral uh, combination and phi two, phi two daggers, uh, phi two, phi three, they should uh, be canceled with the daggers. Right? 
And so what we know is that there is a dual description, and in this case it is S1 times ADS5, classic collection. I should be really close to this one. So and uh, this is ADS part, and obviously this one is S1 part. So what we can do in this uh, description, we can uh, rather efficiently compute expansion of dimensions in n equals 4 at large lambda, right? So and we know that they behave as square root of the top coupling uh, from this uh, picture. Uh, so you just have to find classical string solution and to find its energy, and this gives you the coefficient in front of the square root of lambda. Uh, another thing one can compute, find solution which has uh, this boundary condition, and then because it's a tunnel in process, essentially, uh, it should be exponentially suppressed in the lambda. Yeah, this is a do do at the classical level, otherwise uh, you have to write the whole sigma model. Right? So I, I don't want the, 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 because I want just to show motivation for what kind of structure you should expect uh, at strong coupling. I just want to write this uh, part of the Lagrangian. Right? So now, as it was discussed already today, uh, when we want to go to fishnet limit, we have first to introduce this deformation parameter theta. No, I, ha I this is out of uh, uh, R symmetry. It's U1 in R symmetry, but then I have the full ADS. Well, I, I wrote the simplest possible Lagrangian just to, to absorb some features. I'm not going to use it seriously, right? I just want to <laughs> describe some features. For me, it's you know, not, not really relevant to uh, this uh, Lagrangian. Right? So, hey, this is maybe even smaller size than this. Uh, but important, I want just to concentrate on the ADS5 part, <coughs> on the bosonic uh, part of ADS. So, okay, so uh, we, uh, as was discussed, Instead of commutator in the interaction of n equals 4, you have to twist the commutator, so depending on the order of fields, you introduce some extra uh, factor. And then you can take this limit, lambda to 0. Uh, well, I would uh, love to do this, but I, I don't really know. So you one, uh, one way to think about this twisting is, uh, I mean, it's probably not totally correct, and since we have to do this PST uh, thing, and then get something uh, real ugly, but another way of thinking is that it's like kind of open string, uh, which is closed modular global symmetry rotation. So you just, uh, you open your string and you, you look for solutions such that after rotation it becomes closed. So at least classically this uh, equivalent. Yeah, so you keep the same background, just uh, open string and uh, make it periodic model of the global transformation. Um, right, so that's what you have to do, lambda to zero, and this combination uh, fixed so that only one of these terms survive uh, in, in your theory. Oops. Um, right, and then if you look uh, at what happens in the dual action model of this uh, TST, problem, uh, one one thing to notice, of course, that lambda goes to zero, so it becomes very quantum string, right? So you can hope to uh, replace the square root of lambda by psi, just by some cheap field rescaling, but then what you will get, you will get uh, that instead of radius, which is normally set to one, you get some combination of couplings here. So if you send lambda to zero, uh, Essential what you end up is with some kind of a light form, right? Instead of ADS, the expectation from this very rough, uh, uh, very rough and speculative picture, because we understand the string is not really uh, strongly coupled, is that at least light cone is uh, something we expect. So it's very small 
idea. And then if you like take into account corrections to the fishnet, you should uh, create small radius and gradually go away on the left. All right, so now let me formulate the problem. So given this Lagrangian, very easy, we want to find the dual Lagrangian such that it has xi in front. So first of all, why do we know that uh, this exists? So uh, it is not uh, the limit which uh, uh, Ben described because now we want to take xi large. So uh, at first we don't have any evidence. So let's give a look to some um, data which we extracted using uh, integrability. For example, if you take trace of phi one cube and compute the spectrum, it's a quite entertaining spectrum. It's not this boring spectrum of n equals four, as you can see, where everything is just like go from weak coupling to strong coupling in the like shortest possible way. <laughs> so here you see it's quite crazy, right? So the state, they like attract each other, they like go away and obviously they are, uh, they, they are complex so there is real imaginary parts and that's this point which Benjamin uh, discussed um, then when you increase length so he, he did it for all lenses but this is length 3 so that was the point of Ben and now no, not of his uh, existence of this uh, the one he contributed <laughs> okay it's a bit uh, uh, I withdraw my statement so anyway <laughs> Uh, what we see from that is that actually dimension. Yeah, so here it's positive. I have some other pictures. Uh, actually, it's a good thing to do is to take it slightly complex because now you don't have any obligation to keep it real. Um, so if you make it complex, actually, they, they don't uh, collide. Yeah. So what happens at this plane, uh, you can see that this state start from the state, then it collides with its mirror state, and then they live in the complex plane. Uh, <coughs> so another observation is that the four-point function, which can be also computed, and I will show on the next slide, probably, uh, it behaves as strong coupling also in uh, accordance with the expectations of some uh, classical description, right? So it also looks like a tunneling process. Okay, so to introduce and we introduce again the uh, setup. Let me say so uh, operators I consider for simplicity, let's say phi one and then some neutral pair of phi two. You can also have some phi threes. And all this uh, operate, uh, all this phi's could be at different points, doesn't matter. So that's this operator uh, in the middle. And then what happens is phi two, phi two dagger, they annihilate each other on the first instance. And then after some time, you just start growing this wheel, right? So this process here uh, is described by asymptotic bit on that, but then all these wheels, infinitely many of them, they are missing in the asymptotic description. And so first wheel is Luther correction, and then it's nightmare. Um, right, so the, there is this operator, which was before denoted by H, so this graph building operator B, which contains all this, uh, uh, propagators going outside and also links going around. So uh, by resumming all these diagrams here, which appear in any correlator of uh, these operators, and what you will uh, do, you will just find some geometric progression. Yeah? And then the correlation function essentially up to this dressing with some finite to the normalization of the state is just a um, some uh, matrix element of this operator. Yeah, we, we had it, but it was H, unfortunately. Another uh, misnotation in the previous talk. Previously. So, <coughs> so it looks like it would be cool to diagonalize this B, right? So, of course, in general, I mean, maybe there is uh, some SOV construction which will finally do that. And the uh, actual eigenvalues we can compute already, but the eigenfunctions are a bit tougher, but in the particular case when you only have two scalars, uh, due to the conformal symmetry, uh, there is only tensor you can write. So, uh, so it's not only one because actually it's parameterized by a continuous parameter delta, and also actually it's not around which point you apply. So here I just set it to zero. 
So there are uh, there is this continuous parameter delta, and s obviously should be integral. And then it's guaranteed to be eigenfunction of b because b commutes with all conformal groups. Right? Uh, so it is guaranteed that it will be an eigen eigenfunction, and then to compute the eigenvalue, you have to integrate because b is this integration kernel, so you have to integrate in x1, x2, which are four dimensions, so you have this eight dimensional integral. But fortunately, it can be uh, integrated because it's a rather standard conformal integral. So what you find from that is this explicit formula for the eigenvalue. And uh, you see it depends again on this parameter delta, which so far is completely arbitrary. <coughs> so now, uh, how does the spectrum appear? So when you insert a complete base of eigenstates of B, Right, then you can replace B by the eigenvalue, obviously, standard thing. And uh, then what happens is uh, you can, instead of integrating over delta, you can just pick all these poles in denominator. Right? So it's pretty, again, a standard process. So the, in other words, the physical states that correspond to the condition E equals to one. So this selects you the physical states. Yeah, so I have four point function with uh, four phi one. So I have this. This like phi one phi one, phi one dagger, phi one dagger, for example, right at uh, four different points. <coughs> so then in OPE, in other words, of this uh, four point function, you should find physical states. Right, and the way you compute spectrum out of this eigenvalue, you just set this eigenvalue to one. And that gives you the spectrum delta. And then uh, for the more, the residue gives you the structure constant, it's pretty uh, known, and then all, the, all this garbage uh, just gives you the conformal block. All right, so in, in, in our case, what we found, right, you have to uh, solve this quadratic equation get this deltas, and uh, interesting observations that there are only um, two for each spin, only two states, and this is exact structure constant. And we can, uh, for example, expand, if we expand it at three coupling, what we see there are this twist two operator, twist four, and nothing else. Uh, yeah, so it is, OP of phi one, phi one dagger, and phi one, phi one dagger with maybe some box. Oh, what am I saying? This uh, phi one, phi one, phi one dagger. This one, because in this one it's pretty standard. <coughs> right, uh, and. Then, so interesting feature actually. So no, normally we say, okay, this is twist two operator, this is twist four operator, and then we think about them as some like trace of phi one square, trace of phi one dagger, like box phi one. But actually they are just branches, two branches of the, on the same Riemann surface, like uh, in, in, in the, uh, so uh, if you plot it uh, as a function of coupling and go into the negative, you see you can actually go from one operator to another so actually non-perturbative, there is no such notion as like trace of phi one square. You cannot really distinguish trace of phi one square from trace of phi one box phi one. So this um, twists are completely perturbative notions and become uh, total nonsense otherwise. Ooh. Yeah. Uh, so at weak coupling you can identify one is Trace is phi one, phi one, another is phi one, box phi one. Or box is the equivalent to phi two, phi two dagger by equation two. All right, so then another thing you can do now uh, to, to see that the uh, correlation function, the four point function is, is a quite non-trivial object. You can compute this expansion at recoupling and you identify all this uh, harmonic polylogarithm there at each order 
uh, and it becomes messy and messy with order uh, in perturbation theory. But if you switch to single values, harmonic Fourier logarithms, you can do it easily up to seven loops. Uh, so just to show that it's rather non-trivial function which we obtain here. So now uh, our goal is actually strong coupling. Uh, so at strong coupling, it's easy to expand and you see this delta actually uh, becomes this. So if S is taken to be of order of psi, so delta scales as predicted as psi. So it does have classical scaling exactly the same as in the n equals four case. Just now the role of square root of lambda is played by psi. So in doors, also you can take uh, this sum and try to compute it at strong coupling and you find this uh, nice expression once you actually pass to the, instead of ZZ bar, where it's complete nightmare, uh, to this, which we did in the paper. And that was like at the, uh, uh, we were in fight with Grisha at the end because it was so ugly, we couldn't believe our eye. But once you pass into these variables, it becomes uh, really nice. So instead of uh, ZZ bar, they just uh, put one leg at minus one, another at one, and then uh, in center of mass, you have this distance e to the row and angle theta. Uh, yeah, so, so both operators, they just differ by the sign, so one become purely complex uh, if you assume psi to be real, of course, right? And another will become uh, uh, just order of uh, just psi, right? But you can also scale spin classically and then you get some non-trivial function. And uh, also you see that's a strong indication that there is some classical limit of this model, uh, which is a dual description, equivalent to what string would do for us in n equals four super n mode. So all right. Why two? Well, uh, it depends. You can say it's open trace, or you can uh, write it uh, with trace and do some phi two phi two dagger. Yeah, we did nothing. So it is a uh, kind of similar to this uh, octagon thing, just with uh, k equals two. So it's rather opposite limit to what was considered before. So instead, it only contains wrapping correction, nothing else. So we understood from this simple example what is going on. So we have to take this B and try to find uh, uh, its spectrum and then we, uh, we set B to be one and that gives us the quantization condition for the dimension. So however, there is one trick uh, to do. One can act on this operator B uh, with a set of uh, Laplacian. So if I act by a product of Laplacian on this operator, it will invert, uh, it will convert this into delta function, right? And then instead of graph building operator, I prefer to consider this uh, Hamiltonian. So uh, this is here where the derivation of the classical limit uh, starts. So that's our starting point for the derivation. Because now this H is not just uh, some operator, it is actually now we can consider it as a Hamiltonian. So it acts not as an integration, it just acts by multiplication and you have to compute derivatives of your wave function. So exactly like in the case of the Schrodinger case. So if we take this as a Hamiltonian, however, you see we have this unusual condition that Hamiltonian actually doesn't give you the energy, it gives you zero, right, when you act on the wave function. So what, is, uh, what does it remind to us is like quantization of relativistic particle, for example. Uh, in a path integral formula, where this uh, condition is induced from the fact of uh, that you can reparameterize your time, you can replace t by any function of t, right? So this is can be interpreted as a time reparameterization symmetry. So we, we are dealing with some system which has this time reparameterization symmetry. So if we just compute Lagrangian now this Hamiltonian, we, we get this huge mass, uh, and now I can enforce the symmetry, the time reparameterization symmetry uh, in the standard way like we do 
in uh, string theory, we introduce this worksheet kind of matrix, right? This gamma, which is any function of time. So initially it is just one, but if you change t to some function of t, you can achieve any any gamma inform. So let's enforce the symmetry. And now like we do uh, when we go from uh, Polyko, so this looks like a Polyko faction to the Nambu-Gota formulation, we integrate out gamma, right? Because gamma is a symmetry. It can be any function. In particular, I can set it on extremal value. Right, so if I do that, I get this very cute uh, Lagrangian, in my personal opinion. Uh, and what we see now? We see now uh, many symmetries become more clear. First time, reparameterization is quite obvious because I have 2j of this x dots here, right? So when I change t to f of t, it combines nicely with this dt here, right? So it's like in number goto where I have square root and only quadratic in x dot. Here it's just j factors. So then, obviously, it has translational symmetry. I can move all axes and I can rotate axes. It's quite obvious. But what is a bit less obvious is that there is a special conformal transformation which also uh, goes through this Lagrangian. Uh, so obviously we need to work a bit more and try to make symmetries a bit more manifest. At the same time, one can stop here, but uh, if you don't respect BDC, then that's what you would do probably. So the standard way to uplift uh, to uplift uh, uh, and uh, have the conformal symmetry um, linearly realized is to introduce two extra coordinates um, and work in terms of this capital X where the last four coordinates, roughly speaking, are uh, our initial small axis and then you have extra condition that it lives on the light cone and X plus is this light cone uh, combination. Right, so let's just see what happens. So we have to use these identities, which are trivially false in terms of this capital X. So what we get is this Lagrangian, which is so far it's just trivial replacement, right? Nothing happens, it's right? just a different uh, way to see it, to write it. And now symmetries become more manifest. So first, of course, uh, still time reparameterization is there. Nothing happened to it. There is now very manifest uh, conformal symmetry, right? Because uh, it's written in terms of scalar product. And what actually is quite uh, uh, unexpected to some extent is that we uh, gained uh, new gauge symmetry. So now we can actually rescale each Xi independently from each other. And because you see there are equal number of Xi's in numerator and denominator, because you see there is always the same factor with xi times xi minus one, so you can just rescale them independently. So now you have j plus one gauge symmetries. Well, I mean, it depends on, on your background, right? So, <laughs> <laughs> so I just express my personal uneducated uh, uh, impression when I first saw this. Okay. <laughs> So anyway, so there is this rescaling symmetry. So when you have the symmetry, let's uh, let's Polyakov this gauge symmetries back into this uh, Polyakov form, right? But now we have to introduce xi uh, alpha, which uh, which is like one parameter for each gauge symmetry, right? So we have j of this uh, multipliers alpha, and the statement is again that uh, due to the symmetry, we can uh, set them to whatever value you like. So in particular, you can set them to extremum value and then you go back to this Lagrangian. But instead of doing that, you can take advantage of this and set them to one, right? The same way as you do conformal gauge, uh, conformal gauge in the string theory. Yeah, they run from one to J and so we kill uh, by this uh, gauge fixing condition, we kill J gauge symmetries, but we still have one, right? Which is a combination of, of re uh, simultaneous rescaling of all axes and the time reparameterization. So for to fix that, one can introduce this extra gauge condition.
Ah, yeah, so it's just times j, you can say, right? It's just a bit uh, cuter. <laughs> so indeed, it doesn't depend on i. I, but you can sum one, right? So sum one j times, you get j. So it's still non-trivial and finite, what's important. <laughs> right. So that's completely equivalent, but uh, now you see I wrote the theta. So what's the theta? Eta is this Lagrange multiplier, so which enforces x squared to be zero. Right, which actually I had to write it here as well. Just, uh, yeah. No, j is finite. So we are not taking uh, any limit, we're just taking general operator. The only assumption is like uh, the start starting point is chi is large because we want classical limit. But then, okay. Uh, <coughs> so, okay, so we have the thetas, and the thetas, they also transform, actually, if you want to maintain symmetry, you have to transform them when you time with scale. So to fix the, the last gauge symmetry, you can, for fun, set this gauge uh, condition. Why not, right? And then, so if I fix this gauge condition, I can enforce it with another Lagrange multiplier. Let's call it R squared. Okay. If you do it, then you get the section, uh, which this looks like uh, very close to what uh, we were naively getting from just uh, starting from ADS string and uh, sending lambda to zero. So this kind of enforces x squared to be r, but remember r actually should be of course zero, and just it's set to zero in a dynamical way. And then you have this potential and the standard kinetic term, which is quite nice because initially we had this massive product of kinetic terms, which was complete, complete disaster by, by the just following the uh, principle of writing all symmetries explicitly um, in a manifest way and then gauge fixing in a nice way, we arrived to the standard kinetic term. <coughs> yeah. Yeah, so j i is finite, I, is finite. Uh, I mean the range of i is finite, it just uh, count the number number of phi one, and which is finite number j. Okay. Well, I'm sorry, I derived it in front of you. It never appeared. So what it it is what it is. Ah, x x depends on time. No, only on time, right? Because we started uh, from quantum mechanics and we are still in quantum mechanics, right? So it's a quantum mechanics of J particles, which we, uh, one can now interpret as some kind of uh, string bits, right? And J is completely finite. And this is the uh, classical limit of our fishnet mode, right? So now one can uh, say, okay, we have this classical uh, Lagrange, then if you quantize it in the, in the right way, right, picking the right uh, uh, prescriptions, then we should reproduce the whole thing. So in the same way as you say string describe is equivalent to n equals four, exactly, you can also say by definition, this is a, a dual description um, of the fishnet theory in this particular case. Well, uh, again, so I'm sorry, I just, uh, what it is, it is what it is, right? <laughs> well, we can't, uh, so that's, uh, uh, in, uh, normally the strategy is try to get some Lagrangian and do some tests, right? So here we have a pleasure to derive it, and so mm, if, you, if you don't like it, uh, some of its features, then probably intuition have to be upgraded, right? That's the only, <laughs> the only, mm, Think which one can tell about, okay? But uh, uh, one should, of course, do some tests probably of this <laughs> and see whether we can reproduce some of the data. So first, let me just write all equations of motion. So the uh, Virasor analog of Virasora constraint, which comes from the gauge fixing alpha to one, is this condition. So which you can like uh, in the limit when i goes to infinity, or roughly j goes to infinity. Think of the analog of continuous Virasor condition. And then this are the equations of motion. You see they're quite nonlinear. Um, and 
then the charges are just uh, rotation charges because uh, the connected term is totally standard then the expression for the charges is also standard so all charges contained in uh, this covariant um, charge density and the, the delta is delta correspond to rotation in minus one zero and uh, the standard relations Yeah. So it's like I'd be because you can say so it, it is something moving in higher dimension, right? So even though uh, initially it appeared a bit artificially, but then after this gauge fixing, there is no trace of this projectiveness, right? So there is no longer rescaling symmetry in this particular gauge, and that in this gauge where it looks uh, as close as possible to actual string. So of course, I mean. Uh, so ADS didn't uh, emerge uh, magically here, but because it's very simple uh, theory and the graphs one can see collate and maybe there is no in, uh, enough uh, complexity in the graphs to, to make some you know, non-trivial entanglement and uh, all those other ways to understand ADS. They don't apply here. So in this sense, it's as close as possible to the starting point where you have some ADS string action and then try to uh, speculatively set lambda to zero. And again, so it's inconsistent, maybe consistent with uh, what Ben was saying that uh, there should be some line lattice model and that's its exact manifestation, let's hope. All right, so let's now compare with the data. Right, consider the simplest case, j equals two. Actually, even simpler, j equals one, but I didn't do that. So if you have j equals two, you have two particles, right? And you can always like assume you're in the center of mass frame. So you can write straight away this from thus um, for, 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 for the um, um, coordinates. So now we have, we know we have two conserved charges or three conserved charges and they actually uh, take care of most of the dynamics. Uh, they care of the dynamics of s and of phi, so they just linearly depend, uh, scales with time, uh, with so the angle momentum and with uh, the expansion rate. And this s is not uh, the angle momentum, as you can think, it is actually the action. So if you compute action on this solution, you get uh, four psi tau, right? So it's important that action is proportional to tau. <coughs> so. All right, so now uh, what about the Verasora constraint? We have to impose them, and uh, for this choice of time, it, it becomes just this. Uh, so if I plug this, what I find is exactly this condition, which was the spectrum before, which was obtained from the exact spectrum by taking psi to infinity. Right. So that's how the solution looks like. So it's like <laughs> the particles spiraling around each other. Um, and what I'm going to do now is to try to reproduce the four-point function. So what is the logic here? So uh, the logic is the following, that you have to start from some x1, x2, and then the adjust, adjust your initial data in such way that after some time they arrive at x3, x4. Then we compute action on on this solution, and hopefully it will reproduce our four-point function strong coupling limit. Right, so in this case, it's quite simple. Uh, so the only parameters you have, so a relation between S and delta is fixed. So you only have S as a parameter, right, in your solution. And another parameter is the time, how long time it will take for you. So time uh, is fixed and uh, S is fixed. So you just have to impose that X1 of zero, let's say X1, X2 of zero is X2, and then X3 after some time tau is X3, and that's, oh, what am I doing? It's X1, this is two, it's four. So we know the sex as a function of time explicitly. So we solve this condition and we find 
S as a function of the cross ratio. Say, okay, in our case, we parameterize cross ratios by rho and theta. And also time is a function of rho and theta. Right, so just, it's a trivial uh, exercise. But let's, uh, okay. So, and then we know that, so this set is T minus <laughs> one. <coughs> and then we know that action, action, so let me just write action, is simply minus four psi tau. Right, so in this way you find the ampl probability amplitude of this process uh, by just multiplying this time by four psi. And that's what you get, and that's indeed uh, exactly what we found uh, from the exact result. Okay, so what about three particles? So now you can ask uh, what about like six point functions? So unfortunately we don't have prediction yet from weak coupling, but you can find some classical solutions. They roughly look like that. And you see, so it's there is something going on in the middle and then they like kind of spread around. Why is that? Because this solution, it has some uh, well-defined delta and delta defines your expansion rate. So they're like doing something, but at a bigger and bigger scale. So the better way to, to look at this picture is to map it to a cylinder, right? And then these particles, they will just like do their things, but moving the center mass will move with a more or less constant rate, which is proportional to the delta over three. So, and if you do that, so you see I'm in the frame which moves together with particles. That's uh, how the solution looks like, which in principle can describe you the six point function Right, if you give me prediction. Uh, and at the same time, it justifies the name, the fish chain, right? You can look at that as some fishes in an aquarium. So and they like, like to play with each other. <laughs> so and you see when they approach each other, they like wander around each other and then like go to the next destination. Um, all right. So another feature which is like, expected uh, is integrability. Um, so now we have some kind of chain model, right, with these particles, uh, which are six dimensional vectors. And the question is whether it's an integrable theory. So, and to show it's integrable, you can use the same approach as the one applied for total spin chain. So what you have to do, you have to find a pair of matrices, L and V, and then uh, show that they satisfy this relation. So where u is a spectral parameter, and uh, <coughs> then what you can do, you can easily show that T, which is built out of product of the cells, uh, is conserved in time. So how it works, you just uh, hit it with derivative in time, uh, and one of the cells becomes the sum of two, and then they cancel in chain, so this will cancel with the previous term and this will cancel with the next one. So it's quite obvious, um, so if you have this relation, how to build this T of U and then T of U will be conserved in time just as a consequence of this relation. Right, I mean, it's a bit uh, tricky, but it works. Uh, because what's the point? The point is now you can expand on this U and each term in this expansion of U will give you some conserved uh, quantity. So in our case, we found uh, this L and V. So L can be written in terms of this charge density. If you remember, this Q is a charge density, it's just a standard combination. And J is kind of a current density you can define because Q dot is uh, this combination of J's. And then it's one can check uh, that this is satisfied. And this is rather non-trivial because you can see that V contains negative power of U, for example. So you can assume that this combination may also contain this negative power of U, but then it will contradict the left-hand side, which only have positive powers. But this works, the consequence of all this um, Viratoro constraints and the equations with motion. So I mean, we had kind of a couple of uh, panic attacks trying to cancel these terms <laughs> with Amit, uh, because we thought maybe everything is wrong and integrability is broken. And then the point in the 
all this holography we don't want to get those things <laughs> all right so i'm more or less finished now so there are like quite a few future directions one can think about uh, one can uh, take seriously this action and uh, do this one loop expansion which simone can help us maybe <laughs> or we have to ask Arkady otherwise um, so then uh, another thing so uh, to consider it seems possible to also implement uh, non-planar corrections right St starting gluing this fish chain uh, together with some vertices uh, and then if you have non-planar correction you can already ask question about uh, the, the gravity kind of limit because only with non-planar correction it become interesting so I, I, I'm not going to speculate about this much then <coughs> uh, since we have this integrability description now in strong coupling is very very easy to deal with you can start building this uh, separation of variables basis and uh, repeat uh, those results which were made uh, first in string uh, in a very heroic way here which would be really trivial to repeat all of them so then uh, one could like to match with the talk of Benjamin and then uh, it was mentioned that there are some different types of fishnets in 3d coming from ABG and in 6d which some people speculate may be related to this Tacoma zero model right which is then could have uh, M theory dual so maybe by repeating some kind of derivation I presented you can reproduce some discretized my membrane action and uh, there are also those modifications where you have supersymmetries. We can uh, play this localization in this uh, case. I don't know how it's going to work, though. Uh, and then maybe uh, the most interesting one can try now to patch this fishnet with corrections uh, and try to go away from fishnet, strict fishnet limit. And in this limit, one uh, with this correction, one should start seeing the ADS radius um, emerging, right? Uh, and then, so not many people know, but a fish, fish net is uh, so SYK is a particular case of uh, fish net. One can say it's just the case of one dimension J equals two, right? Uh, because then, so D equals one, you get exactly a conformal point. So it's uh, one of this version of fish change. Particular case of this is SYK. Uh, and then, okay, we can get more insight about n equals four, and who knows what else. All right, so I have extra slides. I don't know if you care about. So if you want, I can show it to you. If there is a question, uh, how to actually do the strong coupling limit from uh, from this OP type formula. Okay, let me stop here. <laughs>